stay warm as they watch the fireworks. Take okay. a look at that. Take a look at this. This is interesting. Downtown LA, there were no fireworks, but there was that. People ringing in the new year with an incredible 3D video display. That's on City Hall there, downtown oh, LA. That. And then some of the more unique celebrations also <laughs> taking place across the country. Brasstown, North Carolina, they celebrated with a possum drop. Mm. And the city of Atlanta lowering down an 800 pound peach. I think Very if there beautiful. was, if you combine those and there was an 800 pound possum, then we'd really be cooking with gas. Well, and we've been asking people at home to let us know yes. how you have spent uh, New Year's Eve. So, you know, we'll, we'll take it to the couch. Todd, what'd you do for people well, that are just joining see, us now? At, jumped at in there because what I was going to do is I was going to set it up with you talking about your exciting, okay. your awesome New Year. But Peter and I will tell you what we did. We'll <laughs> go quickly. Um, there's you, Lisa with yeah, there's Ed Lisa. Henry and Superman. Superman. Right. Yeah, so this was so special. I'm telling you, I had the most fun I think I have ever had. You're dancing. Haven't I was, stopped yeah, dancing since, what was, time was that, was 8 so, o'clock last night? Um, I got, who knows. It was so, so, so much fun, though. I mean, because this is something we've all watched on TV growing up, and it was so special to be there. I had so much fun with Ed Henry and Dean Kane. They were the best co-hosts. We had a blast together. We basically spent two hours embarrassing ourselves, laughing at ourselves, having a ton of fun. And it was also so cool because you could hear all the musical acts, including Nick Jonas, and people like that. But there, there were a lot of really cool musical acts, and it was cool as well because you could hear how excited everyone was. Right. I mean, people were going nuts. They were screaming. They were cheering. We were going nuts. We were screaming. We were cheering. Uh, they got, they caught us dancing on tape. So very embarrassing because I'm a horrible dancer. Along those lines, but it was a blast. Let me interrupt. Um, we Go talked about it. Superman, Dean Kane earlier. What is Ed Henry's signature dance move? Uh, good question. I think there's the people want to know. I think there was more bopping, but you know, I was busting his chops and giving him a hard time because it was so cold out that you you were like crying, and so he kept tearing up throughout the entire. How do you uh, know he hours. wasn't just moved? Well, by and that's what, and that's what, what I was. I was. I, that's what I was asking him because I, I was like, Ed, I didn't realize you were such a sensitive guy. And he really started tearing up at the 9 p.m. hour, right before, you know, we were wrapping. We only had about an hour left of the show. So I think he was just really moved and was really sad that the show might be ending. Well, no tears at Mar-a-Lago last night. That's where the president was for his New Year's Eve celebration. And he had a prediction for the next 365 days. Happy New Year. We're going to have a great year. It's going to be a fantastic 2018. We're off to a very good start, as you know, with the great tax cuts and ANWR and getting rid of the individual mandate, which was very, very unpopular, as you know. But we are going to have a tremendous year. The stock market, I think, is going to continue to go up. Companies are going to continue to come into the country, and uh, they're doing it now, soon to be a record clip. Well, and as he said, you know, I've been saying this, but not just with the tax reform law that he got passed, but even just including that in, in that law and what they got done there was also the repeal of the individual mandate, something that Republicans have been talking about for eight years now, and also opening up drilling uh, it, for Anwar. And that's been something that proponents have been fighting for for 40 years. Tax reform is something that people have been pushing for right. uh, for three decades now. So all of these things really are monumental uh, developments, monumental changes that many people have been fighting for for many, many years. And so I think the big question, guys, is, you know, what happens in 2018? We're there now. This is the very first day. What does the Trump administration get done? Do they take that momentum uh, into, to, into this year? And, and what do we see? And I want to spin it around on you guys because Ooh. you guys are there in right. D.C. You're on the Hill. You are there in D.C. You're talking to the people. Do you think that once we get the government funded, it will be all systems go for infrastructure? What do you think, Peter? You're talking it, all these It guys. really depends on how things are going to go. The first order of business will be that funding fight because right. the Democrats appear poised to use DACA as leverage to get what they want or to stop the Republicans from getting everything that they want. So that will be very telling for how everything is going to go. Of course, Republicans were able to muscle through the tax reform bill with only Republican votes, but that is because they used that crazy reconciliation right. process where they only needed 51 votes or 50 plus the vice president. Anything immigration related, you need 60. Right. And so you need some Democrats. Well, and on immigration, I think what's really going to be interesting is you're going to have divides in both parties because Republicans aren't all in agreement in what to do 
on, on immigration fixes. You know, President Trump wants the wall. There's a lot of Republicans who don't support that. There's some who do support uh, the wall. You're also looking at things like the RAISE Act, which Senators Tom Cotton and Purdue introduced, President Trump endorsed, which basically takes a look at legal immigration, uh, moving it towards skilled labor, right. uh, and sort of being a little bit more judicious about the folks that we, we bring into the country. And then on the left, you've got the Democrats who are also split. We saw Nancy Pelosi get attacked by immigration activists who have been saying, hey, you've been promising us changes and you've not delivered. Uh, so I think the left, and especially those immigration activists, they're not going to want to see concessions made uh, by the left on issues like border security. I mean, so there's going to be fights not only with each other, but really within their own parties as well. And what's so intriguing to me, besides the political, can we get these things done from a vote perspective, is how intertwined all these things are. If we want to get infrastructure, we're going to need workers to actually do the work of infrastructure. So that's where we get into to immigration. Do we have the skilled workers necessary? What about welfare reform? If we're getting more people off the welfare rolls, well, that could mean more workers to help with infrastructure. The question then becomes, though, as always, back to the political question, do we have the votes to move things forward? And I think 2018 is going to be so interesting when we see how all that pans out. Peter, do you think they, you know, you're, you're on Capitol Hill, you're talking to members of Congress on, on a daily basis. Do you think they have the votes on, you know, DACA or trying to get, uh, sorry, trying to get infrastructure done? I don't think they know. Yeah. I really don't. And point. they're not giving themselves much time before this next funding fight, which is January 19th. Right. The Senate comes back on Wednesday. The House doesn't come back until January 8th. And so they're going to have like eight working days to get things done. So we'll, I'll be standing in the basement chasing people down. Right. Uh, are you going to keep the lights on or not? And then they run away from Peter Ducey and they, we put it on TV. Because they're terrified of you because you, you get to the bottom of it. Uh, and another big issue going on, you know, not just in this country, but really in the world, is Iran is feeling, uh, or President Trump tweeted about this, sorry, rather. Uh, so there four days we've seen this anti-government protest uh, in Iran. President Trump tweeted out, Iran is failing at every level despite the terrible deal made with them by the Obama administration. The great Iranian people have been oppressed or repressed, rather, for many years. They are hungry for food and for freedom. Along with human rights, the wealth of Iran is being looted. Time for change, Excla exclamation mark there. And he's also tweeted out that the world is watching as well. And somebody that President Trump listens to in Washington, D.C., Republican Senator Lindsey Graham, said this weekend that North Korea is watching right now to see what the president does in Iran. He says just tweeting on support of the in support of the protesters may not be enough. Graham wants the president to pull all the way out of the Iran deal and then do something to help these people. He says, if not, he thinks it could embolden and, well, and Tom, him. You both talked to Ambassador Bolton earlier right. today. What do you say? Yeah, because like somebody else the president listens to a lot, and if you listen to some rumors that Mr. Bolton could be in the cabinet there in 2018, he had some very interesting, interesting things to say on our program earlier. Take a listen. President. Trump has already signaled a huge difference from the Obama administration by supporting the protesters, but I think we need to do more. This is yet another reason why the president should get out of the nuclear deal with Iran, should resume all of our uh, previous sanctions, putting increased economic pressure on the regime. We should provide material financial support to the opposition if they desire it. We should work with uh, intelligence services from other countries, Saudi, Israel, to provide more pressure. There's a lot we can do, and we should do it. Our goal should be regime change in Iran. And overnight, the Ayatollah came out against, uh, or rather, Iranian leaders came out against President Trump. They said, you have no right to be siding with the protesters in our country. So what will be interesting to see is who does the world side with? Iranian leaders who are cracking down on peaceful protesters or the president? Yeah, does it look like the United Nations where Alan Dershowitz said last week on our air, you know, the Americans could come up with, uh, you know, the most simple plan in the world, like to give, you know, food to a puppy and the United Nations would vote against it. So it's going to be interesting to see how the world responds to uh, to Iran right there. Well, and, and for those at home uh, who are just tuning in now, we spoke to Michelle Malkin earlier about this very thing. So take a listen. 
The idea that these protests, that the thirst for freedom that President Trump has put his finger on uh, are somehow only uh, driven by quote unquote economic concerns. This is Iranian state propaganda and you have it regurgitated by the likes of CNN that somehow that they're that uh, most of the people that have taken to the streets are only worried about gas prices. They've been repressed. People are stoned for looking the wrong way or dressing the wrong way. When real student-led grassroots protests broke, break out across the country against tyranny, the left is nowhere to be found. And she just hit it there. These protests bubbling up in Iran are driven by the poor economy there. What's interesting about that, last year as part of this Iran deal, the Obama administration said if you cut it out with the nuke program, we'll give you $1.7 billion in cash. It does not appear that people... Got their cut of that. And sometimes I just wish Michelle would, uh, you know, not mince words and give it to us straight. Give us some jo passion. Joking, joking. I mean, she's she always so like non-passionate. Um, but she, I mean, she she always uh, she always does. So clearly that was a joke. But you know who else gives it to us straight? Jillian Mealy. And Jillian. she's here. And Good she's morning. here, fortunately for all of us. Happy New Year. Happy and, New Year. And what's going on? What do, what do Americans do? There's a know? lot going on right now, guys. We are starting off 2018 on a pretty busy note. So let's get you caught up on your headlines right now, starting with this. The suspect behind an ambush attack that left a deputy dead ranted about law enforcement online. Matthew Riel fired more than 100 rounds holed up in his bedroom before being shot dead by officers outside Denver, Colorado. Three deputies, one police officer, and two civilians wounded in the attack as they responded to a noise complaint. We've got three officers hit, one down. All of them were shot um, very, very quickly, um, and uh, they all went down uh, almost within seconds of each other. The fallen officer is identified as 29-year-old Zachary Parrish. The husband and father of two young daughters was on the force for seven months after serving two years as a police officer. His wife says he loved this job more than any job he ever had. Friends remember him as selfless and went to him for scriptural advice. Law enforcement lining the streets, saluting Parrish's body in a show of respect. President Trump offering his condolences online, tweeting, quote, We love our police and law enforcement. God bless them all. All of the wounded are expected to survive. Ten Americans are dead after a fiery plane crash in Costa Rica. The small charter plane crashing into the mountains and bursting into flames shortly after takeoff. Incredible video of the aftermath showing fire and broken jet parts. None of the 12 people on board survived, including a family of five from New York. There are also reports of two Florida doctors and their teenage daughter among the dead. The crash is under investigation. Turning now to extreme weather, the bitter cold gripping the nation. Have you felt it? Some places seeing snow and ice. Those dangerous conditions leading to a 40 car pileup in Michigan. Brand new video just released. Just keep, oh, there's a big truck pile in here. Whoa, 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 right in front of us, down in the ditch. Oh, whoa, here's another one right in, whoa, another one going in. Oh, scary. The Deep South now feeling an Arctic cold front with possible snow and freezing rain. Thousands of people literally diving into the new year. Fearless swimmers ripping off their coats and running into frigid water for the polar plunge in the Netherlands. Most of them running back to shore seconds later. The water was 39 degrees. I don't know if you guys have ever done a polar plunge. My I dad, have. my dad's no. insane and he's done it multiple times. Usually you drink before you go out there. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's how you keep warm. I've done that's it. how I, I felt last night though. <laughs> hands down, it's not that bad in the water. It's when you get out there. Oh, I can imagine. Thanks, <laughs> Julian. President Trump had barely taken office when this New York Times columnist predicted the economy would crash and never recover. Turns out, if you've looked at your 401k, he was wrong. Just the opposite happened. So how long can this trend keep going in 2018? And fired FBI Director James Comey wants to wish you a happy New Year and bash President Trump all at the same time. But Twitter got the last laugh. Wait for that. President Trump had barely taken office when this New York Times columnist, Paul Krugman, made a bold prediction, writing, quote, if the question is when markets will recover, a first pass answer is never. But it turns out the economy under President Trump did recover. In fact, it was booming. So here to break down the biggest business stories of 2017 and what they mean for the new year, former chief economist for the U.S. International Trade Commission and business professor at the University of Maryland. He's a Terrapin. 
Peter Marici. Peter, good to see you here. Happy New Year to you, sir. Um, Happy New Year. This is so fascinating that somebody, an economist, would come out there with such a bold prediction and be so wrong. Let's cue it up with Sarah Sanders' tweet last week in response to uh, Mr. Krugman's beautiful, beautiful prediction. Uh, greatest story of the year, booming at real Donald Trump economy, worst prediction for the year, and then obviously the... Uh, reference to Mr. Krugman's piece. Uh, but, you know, how do you respond to all that, and how can somebody be so off? Well, it's quite simple. Paul Krugman won a Nobel Prize for being a brilliant mathematical <coughs> economist. But when it comes to public policy, he has virtually no common sense. He lets ideology get in the way of the facts. I mean, there was very good reason to believe that this year would be a good year at the beginning of the year. That's what I predicted myself. I predicted a booming stock market over and over again. You know, it comes down to this. If you go to the Ivy Leagues for information, you're bound to get very bad advice. I'm a state college guy. We're out there with the people. We don't make those kinds of bold claims. Ouch. My mom doesn't like that because she just said my Dartmouth education is useless. Thanks, well, Peter. Well, I got a son that went to Cornell, right. and he believes Krugman, you know? Well, hey, Peter, I'm with you. I'm a University of Tennessee grad, so there we right. go. State okay. colleges unite, my friend. All right, so one of the big business stories this year, we've got three quarters of 3% growth. So I want to talk to you because a lot of the um, proponents of the tax reform law are saying that this is going to make the economy boom. This is going to get things growing, uh, lowering that corporate tax rate. What do you think? Well, it was an anticipation of a lower corporate tax rate that business became so much more optimistic. And this notion that the government was going to get out of the way and that regulators were actually going to take lunch, take weekends off and things like that and let people do business again, that got optimism up. And we've had three consecutive quarters of 3% growth. I don't know how Mr. Obama in all of his arrogance can declare ownership of that when he had eight years to accomplish three quarters of three percent growth and just couldn't get done on his watch. I mean, there's a message here that just the promise of supply side economics with someone in the White House, you know, inclined to deliver is enough to inspire the economy. Next year, we're going to have higher corporate profits and we're going to have more strong growth. And you can call me back here next January 1 to task if I'm wrong. <laughs> so, right. Peter, you got the 3% growth, multiple quarters. The other two things that you say were the big stories of 2017, a surge in stock prices and then stronger productivity growth. So the question would be, if all these things continue into 2018, could the Dow hit 30,000 by next New Year's? No, I don't think so. I don't think that's possible. In fact, we may have stronger corporate profits and profits further enhanced by lower taxes without a significant depreciation in the stock market because we've had so much this year. It's hard to get three good years in a row out of the stock market. That doesn't mean it's going to tank or anything. We're not going to have a Krugman rally, but rather, uh, you know, it, it may pause for a bit before it takes off again. Uh, on the Varney show, when it went over its last threshold, I said we could hit, you know, 3,000 by the end of Trump's first term. I think that is a more realistic expectation. But I do think it's realistic to expect that corporate profits will continue to grow. American companies are doing very well in the global economy and productivity. One of the things we're seeing is all the apps in your little devices that are so cool, you know, see what the weather is exactly in the right. zip code I'm at and all that is now starting to go into businesses. It's starting to make our businesses more efficient. It takes money to do that. And now people are going to use the corporate tax cut to make the investments necessary to make that happen. Right. And we're going to see a resurrection in productivity growth. And with that, the potential for rising living standards. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. We, we really appreciate Hope you taking right. the time with us on this happy New Year's New Year. Day. And happy, happy New Year. Year. Always All right. be optimistic. <laughs> there so, you go. Coming up, Kim Jong-un says he's got his finger on the nuclear button. Is the time for diplomacy over? Dan Bongino is here. And from sequels to superheroes, Kevin McCarthy here with a preview of the best movies of 2018. And Fox and Friends returns on your New Year's Day. Happy New Year, everybody. Some quick Monday headlines. Palestine is pulling its envoy out of Washington. The move in protest of President Trump recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Palestinian leaders say Hussam Zomlat will return to work once the two sides can come to an agreement on how to move forward with diplomatic relations. And after being fired by President Trump in 2017, 
Former FBI Director James Comey now sharing his hopes for 2018, tweeting what appears to be a veiled jab at the president. He writes this, here's hoping 2018 brings more ethical leadership focused on the truth and lasting values. Happy New Year, everybody. Comey, though, getting roasted online. Tom tweeted this, Lordy, how could you tweet that with a straight face? Instapundit wrote, well, you were fired in 2017, so that's a start. <laughs> Twitter can always be brutal. All right, well, another year has come and gone, which means that dozens and dozens of more movies will battle it out at the box office in 2018. Here to break down the most anticipated movies of 2018 is Fox News contributor and founder of NerdTears.com, Kevin McCarthy. Kevin, I think your resolution for 2018 should be more energy. <laughs> Said no one ever. Uh, th this is... This is true, and good morning to you guys, and thank you so much for having me on, and Happy New Year. And I'm at home in my parents' house in Williamsburg, Virginia, <laughs> nice. and I forgot to bring a blazer with me, so my dad let me borrow this blazer. It's a little bit big on me, you um, look but beautiful. hopefully it looks okay on TV. Right, sure. Yeah. Well, let, okay, so let's get started. Everyone needs something to look forward to in 2018, which starts today. It, it, it seems weird. Right. All right, so let's start with number five. What, what's your, what's your uh, number five pick uh, for the top movies to look forward to? Yeah, there's a lot of films coming out in 2018 that I'm very, very excited about. The fifth one, no question, is Solo, a Star Wars story. This is the newest Star Wars film coming out May 25th. Uh, the last Star Wars film that just hit theaters in December, I was not a massive fan of, but this is actually a spinoff. This is the younger Han Solo. Alden Ehrenreich is playing this character. Ron Howard's directing this film. You have Amelia Clark from Game of Thrones in the film as well. Also, Woody Harrelson. It looks fantastic just from the behind-the-scenes footage. We have not seen an official trailer yet the footage you might be seeing right now on tv is probably ron howard uh with the uh with re revealing the actual title of the film uh, it's called solo a star wars story and that comes out on may 25th i cannot wait i will say i'm a little upset that the original filmmakers chris miller and Phil Lord left the project. They originally did 21 Jump Street and the Lego movie but they left and ron howard took over so i'm interested to see how that plays out your fourth flick, Mr. McCarthy, The Avengers Infinity War. This is true, and good morning to you, Peter. Uh, yeah, but Avengers Infinity War, I'm very, very excited about this. The Russo brothers directed this film. Now, those gentlemen directed Captain America Civil War as well as Captain America Winter Soldier, the two best films in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. This movie looks insane from the trailers. You have Spider-Man this time around and Tom Holland. I cannot wait to see what happens there. Robert Downey Jr., the cast looks insane. Chris Evans is Captain America. This movie is going to be absolutely mind-blowing just based on the trailers. That hits theaters on May 4th of this, uh, this year. All right. What about Black Panther coming in at number three on your list? I'm telling you right now, this is one of the most exciting filmmakers working today. Ryan Coogler directed Fruitvale Station as well as the movie Creed, obviously the Sylvester Stallone movie with Michael B. Jordan. This movie looks incredible. It opens up on February 16th. Chadwick Boseman is playing Black Panther. Also, you have Daniel Kaluuya from the film Get Out, Lupita Nyong'o. The cast is incredible. The music looks amazing. The film looks incredible. And I cannot wait to see what Ryan Coogler, one of the most exciting young filmmakers, filmmakers does with this movie coming out on February 16th. All right, so moving closer to number one, we've got the sequel to Deadpool. Important note, there's no official title yet. Why should people look forward to this in 2018? Well, first of all, Lisa, Deadpool was my favorite movie of 2015, no question, 2016. I loved Deadpool. I saw it nine times in theaters. Ooh. I thought Deadpool won. I know. I Listen, I thought Deadpool 1 was brilliant because it was a lower-budget superhero film that used the idea of necessity as the mother of invention. They basically took this low budget and made one of the best superhero films I've ever seen, and I cannot wait to see what Ryan Reynolds does with the sequel on June 1st. The director of this film is David Leach, who also did Atomic Blonde earlier this uh, last year, which was a phenomenal action film with Charlie Theron. So the writers are back from Deadpool 1, and and I cannot wait to see what type of jokes they do uh, in Deadpool 2. That, the no title yet, and there's been very minimal footage coming out. But I'm kind of hoping, I saw a joke on Twitter, that they keep the title Untitled Deadpool Sequel. That'd be kind of funny just <laughs> uh, in regards to like the jokes they do. And Kevin, so. the movie you are most excited about is the next one from Steven Spielberg. This is true, Peter. Yeah, Ready Player One. I 
cannot wait. I just sat down with Spielberg for this movie called The Post, which is out right now. If you haven't seen it, definitely see it. One of the most important films uh, of 2017. But Ready Player One is based on a very popular novel by Ernest Cline. It tells the story of a kid who goes into a virtual reality world, and he has to find an Easter egg that was left by the creator of this massive world called the Oasis. And it looks, the visuals, when I read this book, all I kept saying to myself was, how are they going to turn this into a movie? And I cannot wait to see what right. Spielberg does with it. It opens up on March 30th. No question, one of my favorite books of all time. Check it out cool. if you haven't read it. Well, thank you, Kevin. He may sound like Guy Fieri when he does Skype, but he is Kevin McCarthy joining us happy in 2018 <laughs> for his top five movies. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. All hey, right. Happy New Year, guys. Happy thank New Year. Too. Coming up, Kim Jong-un says he's got his finger on the nuclear button. Fox News alert. Is the time for diplomacy over? Dan Bongino is here. And guys, let me be the first to welcome, wish you a happy Barack Obama Day. Yeah, it's now law in one state. We'll tell you when and where when and Fox and Friends returns. The world is burning to the ground. It's your shot of the New Year's morning. The crystal ball in New York City Times Square wasn't the only thing dropping on New Year's Eve. A 400-pound marshmallow peep helped ring in the New Year in Bethlehem, PA. I mean, that looks delicious. It looks yummy. But not to be outdone, partygoers in Key West, Florida celebrated by dropping a supersized red high heel. And a music note dropping in Nashville seems fitting to mark the arrival of 2018. So, your New Year's pictures are pouring in as well. Like this one from Dave and his wife, Juanita, ringing in New Year 2018 from Atlantic Beach in Florida. Also smart to be in Florida. Yes. All right, well, <laughs> check out this Fox and Friends viewer having a great time on the Georgia Queen Riverboat. Good stuff. And here's Bar Bob and Bridget Wade celebrating the New Year's with friends in Connecticut. Also Wait. down in Florida, Dan Bongino. Happy New Year, Smart sir. Man. How did you spend the evening? Yeah, Happy New Year. Yeah, Happy New Year, guys. Um, uh, listen, my wife and I have, a, have this little tradition. She makes me, she's Colombian, so she makes me eat 12 grapes and drink a little champagne at midnight. But I was asleep <laughs> by about 12.01 and 27 seconds. So nice. unlike Lisa, I got some good sleep <laughs> less. I don't know how you're doing it, Lisa. Is, is but that, God bless that, you. You're a trooper. Is that a, is that a good luck? So maybe I should do this uh, today for heading into the New Year. Is that something for good luck? It's... It's a Colombian tradition. My right. wife swears by it. The problem is she got these grapes, and instead of the small ones, they were all like grapefruits. But I, I could barely <laughs> sleep afterwards. I had so many grapes in my stomach. I said, get the small grapes next time. <laughs> All right, well, Dan, you know, obviously a lot happened in 2017, but I want you, you know, what's the most important event of the year in your mind? You know, the, the most important event to me was the Trump switch in personnel decision making. I know that sounds like an overly wonky thing, but this is a guy who was a Queens builder who gets in office. Obviously, the first few months were a bit chaotic. Expectedly, he was a builder from Queens. He was not a politician. There was going to be chaos. But combined with the press and their overwhelming Trump derangement syndrome, there was a need to straighten that chaos out right away. That's what he did. We had some major league appointments. We had game-changing appointments in game-changing positions. John Kelly, Naomi Rao over at Regulatory Affairs, uh, Mick Mulvaney at OMB. I mean, these were really critical positions, and that paved the way for a second half of 2017 that I think was unbelievably successful. Red tape, tax reform, uh, you know, getting rid of red tape, uh, it just, you know, the individual mandate. This was a great second half. With those folks in their positions right now, what do you see the Trump administration accomplishing in 2018, and what specifically do you want the administration to accomplish? Well, I see two things. These are the two priorities that if, if I were sitting there in the White House right now, I would make them one and two by far. Number one, you have to get rid of Obamacare. Whether, we, whether it's done in one fell swoop, which looks unlikely because we have some Republicans in Congress who are backtracking on their promises, or if it's done just by getting rid of community rating, guaranteed issue, and slowly chipping away at this garbage piece of legislation, that has to go. Yeah, Dan, what, do you, what do you make of, uh, what do you make of, so Senator Mitch McConnell said, you know, let's move on from repeal in 2018. So what do you make of that? You, you were talking about Obamacare um, no. there. 
Yeah, uh, throw the red flag under the hood for review here. Let's not move on, Mitch. Listen, with all due respect to Senator McConnell, this is like literally what you ran on for the last six years. Republican voters gave their time, their money, their energy, their blood, sweat, and tears to get rid of this debacle. They're paying thousands of dollars extra a year for crappier insurance nobody wants. This is like kind of a big deal, fellas. You need to get rid of this. It's not time to move on. Either get rid of it in pieces or get rid of it in one fail swoop, but you better get rid of it. And you also better take on entitlement spending as well, because we have this menace of debt, this tidal wave coming ashore that's going to hit soon. It's time to get busy on this and stop, you know, as they say, kicking the can. So more can to kick. Dan, it was about this time last year before President, now President Trump got sworn in that there are reports President Obama told him that the biggest national security threat to his administration during his term or terms would be North Korea. And now last night in yeah. Kim Jong-un's New Year's address, he said that he's got a button on his desk that could nuke any place in the United States. The president did just talk about this on his way into the New Year's celebration. And we're going to hear from the president, and then I want to hear, Dan, what you think. We'll see. We'll see. So he seems willing to wait and see how things play out. What do you think he should do, Dan? Well, he's never been one for telegraphing his next move, which I applaud him. But uh, I also want to applaud, uh, applaud uh, Kim Jong-un for, uh, you know, he said he's got the nuclear button on his desk. So now we know exactly where to drop the uh, bunker buster. So <laughs> thanks for giving us some, some uh, geostrategic targeting information. We appreciate that. But the real question right here with Kim um, is, is, is Kim a rational actor or not? Now, people get confused by this question a lot, but we're not saying is he evil or not. He's obviously an evil human being. Uh, uh, th th that's without question. He has no morals or ethics. He lives in an intellectual vacuum. But the question is, if, whether he's evil, is, is he rational? Is he interested in self-preservation and self-survival? Uh, or does he even care anymore? That's the only critical question right now. Because if he is rational, he's not dumb enough to launch a first strike. If he's not, obviously that's in a game changer because Guam, Hawaii, and the west coast of the United States are, are already in play. And most of the United States will be in play relatively shortly if he continues on this nuclear glide path. There's no doubt that obviously North Korea is number one in terms of geopolitical issues. But let's not forget about Iran. Uh, President Trump tweeting, Iran is failing at every level despite the terrible deal made with them by the Obama administration. The great Iranian people have been repressed for many years. They are hungry for food and for freedom. Along with human rights, the wealth of Iran is being looted time for change. And obviously a tricky situation whenever you're involved with anything in the Mideast. But this is a country that just a few years ago, not even two years ago, Peter and, and Lisa and Dan, we gave a pallet of $1.6 billion to them to get them to kind of chill out. Uh, so what do you see in 2018 with regard to the U.S. relations with Iran? And what do you see happening in Iran when it comes to these protests? Well, here's the key difference between these protests now and what happened in, in, in 2009, when the Obama administration sat on the sidelines and, and basically let this, uh, they had a golden opportunity to foster regime change with the world's largest terror regime, a regime whose, whose motto is death to America. The difference now is you're starting to see, now, to be candid, these are unconfirmed reports on Twitter, but you're seeing these pictures appear of Revolutionary Guard soldiers uh, and their resignation letters. Now, I, I can't confirm them. as I'm not a journalist, but it's impossible to confirm almost anything coming out of Iran because of the, the blanket oppression of the media, the social media environment, and journalists. I mean, there are reporters from major newspapers who nobody's heard from in a week now. So nobody really knows what's going on. But if that's the case, and the most hardened uh, Revolutionary Guard soldiers, are, are some of them at least, are taking a step back and saying, you know, we're not going to kill our own people this time. That regime is in a world of trouble. And, and that is, by the way, is great news for the world. This is the world's largest sponsor of terror. These are savages. These people need to go, and the sooner the better. Well, and Dan, as a former NYPD police officer, I want to get your thoughts. So some sad news. Um, as Americans were celebrating 2018, another family is mourning the loss of a police officer uh, shot and killed in Colorado uh, on New Year's Eve. Why are we seeing so many police deaths, Dan? 
You know, I, I think it had a lot to do with the dehumanization of police through this war on cops you've seen by, by some. Granted, a limited group of people in the country who had a, an agenda that was not the police agenda. And I think what it did is it dehumanized cops. I think what people forget, Lisa, is... You know, th th these are these are just moms and dads and sons and uncles and aunts and coaches. That's their job. Their job is is if they don't get paid a lot of money. The NYPD I got, and I think my starting salary was like twenty three thousand dollars a year. They're never going to become famous. There's no notoriety in it. Very few people give them a pat on the back at the end of the day. You know, I think what we have to remember is these are human beings. You know, one of the best lines I ever heard. I can't say this enough. Is I was at a a, a celebration ceremony for some heroic cops out in New Mexico once and a woman got up and said she was a spouse of a police officer and she said the greatest sound in the world is the sound of velcro at night and everybody in the room knew what that meant you know what that means when a cop comes home at night he has his body armor his bulletproof mm -hmm. vest on underneath and when you take it off the velcro it's so loud and every spouse knows that their husband or their wife who's a cop made it home safely that night I never forgot that and we have to remember these cops are dads and moms they're human beings this poor guy who's died he's never gonna take another breath of oxygen his kids his parents his family they're never gonna see him again all for what to keep you safe He's not doing this to get rich, and I think it, we should all keep that in our hearts in the new years. Well, they're, they're, you know, listen, cops and, are men and women; they make mistakes. And, and our hearts and prayers are with his wife and two.